Good afternoon, and welcome to the 100 Women Project's Women's History Month Lecture with Jennifer Carpentieri. I'm Stan Kula, Executive Director of the Foundation for Sussex County Community College. The 100 Women Project is part of the College Foundation, which raises funds to support the students of Sussex County Community College. This initiative was established in 2013 with the goal of garnering pledges from 100 women in the business and professional communities in order to endow scholarships for non-traditional aged women students attending Sussex, especially those returning after an interruption in their education for any reason. Thanks to all of the members of the 100 Women Project for their generous support, and a special thanks to our sponsors, Project Self-Sufficiency, Franklin Mutual Insurance Company, and Provident Bank, who made this program possible. For those of you who have not yet made a gift and wish to do so, please visit www.sussex.edu slash 100 Women Project to make your gift online. Following today's lecture, you will have the opportunity to ask Jennifer a question during our Q&A period, so be sure to submit your questions by clicking on the chat button on your screen and then typing in your question. But before we begin, it is my great honor to introduce the founder of the 100 Women Project and a member of the Foundation's Board of Directors, the Honorable Judge Lorraine Parker. Thank you, Stan. This afternoon, it is my great pleasure to be introducing to you Jennifer Carpentieri as our speaker for this year's 100 Women Celebration of Women's History Month and today being International Women's Day. Jennifer is the Behavioral Health Manager for the Atlantic Health System. Prior to going with Atlantic Health, uh, she had been the Morris County Director of Human Services, and she has held various roles within the county, Morris County, for 17 years. Her career, <coughs> pardon my voice, her career path has led her to the public sector, the pro nonprofit sector, and the healthcare sector over the years. She was a psychological first responder and was particularly involved with 9-11 and certainly uh, a member of the Morris County uh, Crisis Response Team. Uh, Jennifer is also an advocate for eliminating the mental health stigma uh, for people who are uh, in need of mental health services, and she herself is a COVID long hauler. So she has a lot of experience with the issues that arise out of uh, being involved with COVID and the pandemic over the past two years. And her topic today is uh, resilience and building, uh, managing emotions and building resilience. So building resilience, I think, is something we're all looking to right now, particularly as we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel uh, for the close of the pandemic crisis period. So with great pleasure today, I introduce, inter, introduce you to uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. It, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody today. Um, yes, I will be talking about uh, COVID-19 and how we are managing our emotions and moving forward and building our resiliency. Uh, we are also going to be um, joined by uh, one of my esteemed colleagues, Sharon Kelly, who is a clinical social worker. Unfortunately, she was unable to be in the studio with us today, but she is here with us and will be part of our uh, Q&A and also to help us wrap up. Uh, no one wants to hear me talk the whole time, so she'll help us wrap up a bit. So today we're going to talk about, oops, sorry. We're gonna talk about the impacts that the pandemic has had on us and their effect. We're going to talk about tips for acceptance and learning to live with the uncertainties that we have 
to manage every day. We're going to talk about tips and techniques to combat stress and build that resiliency that we all have and knowing where to get help. Sometimes we all need a little help. So I myself uh, am a, a COVID long hauler and the topic today is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I will share my personal um, reasons why this work is so important for all of us and these, these really getting together for meaningful discussions about mental health and, and building resilience are so important. Uh, I, I was in the first wave and continued to manage long COVID symptoms. My mother-in-law who lived with us, unfortunately, did not survive COVID. And so we as a family have had to manage not just the quarantine and, and homeschooling and working from home, <coughs> but we've had to manage me being ill, having lost a family member, and guiding and navigating families, our, our, my children and, and, and our family through these, these tough times. And so it's very important and, and uh, I'm very grateful to the, the um, 100 Women's Project for allowing me to come and speak with you this afternoon. And so we will start with emerging from the pandemic. We are at this precipice where signs of normalcy are, are beginning to emerge. States are rolling back mask mandates and people are gathering again. And while that may be something that's great for some people, what's normal for everybody and what feels comfortable isn't always the same. And so while local health officials continue to encourage us to, to fight the virus with getting our vaccines, and of course, maintaining social distance and, and good hand hygiene. Moving forward, we also have to take stock in how this pandemic has affected people's well being. Because what's normal and comfortable for one may not always be normal and comfortable for someone else. And so it's important for us to look back because we certainly want to move forward. And so when we talk about COVID, eh, we have to stop and take a minute and think about the losses. Not everybody thinks about COVID in a loss of maybe a loved one or, or of something of that magnitude, but let's look at loss from a different perspective. Let's look at loss of routine, possibly employment, loss of freedom, some control. How about predictability and the sense of safety and security? I know, a lot of people missed milestones for themselves and their children and, and family rituals and family gatherings that were extremely important. And so when we talk about COVID, we have to just think for a moment, how did it impact us? And did I have a loss? And if you think about it, I think we can all say we did, right? Loss of control, expectations, a loss of maybe what once was. And so common reactions to a loss are varied and, and, they're, and they're different for everybody. So maybe some fear, grief and sadness, confusion, denial, um, questioning faith, or, or maybe sleeping too much or eating too much, or maybe the reverse, sleeping too little and maybe not having an appetite. Loneliness, forgetfulness. There are so many, that, and again, they're very individualized and unique. And so we have to remember that each person is going to react differently to, to these situations, to grief and loss, and it's okay. And it's okay if that looks different for everybody. So taking a moment to reflect and understand how the pandemic, maybe just taking a breath and really thinking about how did this pandemic mentally and physically affect me? And yeah, maybe you're not feeling completely normal and maybe you are. And again, that's okay. But remember that it's gonna take time to heal and to allow our emotions to settle into what's comfortable. 
And in order to do that, sometimes people do it on their own. And sometimes you need some support or maybe some, some education or, or different techniques on how to do that. And that's okay as well. And we'll talk about those today. So as I said, really taking a moment to understand how the pandemic has impacted you is going to move us forward. Some of us had physical reactions, as we, as we said, maybe your headaches and, and, and really uh, irritability and, 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 and the, the feeling of weakness or maybe just lack of endurance, right? Others, it was more emotional. Maybe you had a really strong reaction to, to wearing masks one way or the other. Maybe you, were, you felt put out or maybe you were, didn't want to leave the house without one. And maybe there was a strain about, of the inconsistency of working from home or the kids being home and having to maybe share workspaces and, and having that loss of contact and routine. And for others, such as myself and my family, we had to deal with losing loved ones and, and illness and how that really impacted us and, and, and how we've had to move on and adapt. So as I said, understanding the personal impact that it's had on you will really help you to, to chart that path to healing and to moving forward and understanding that not everybody's going to be in that same stage. So when you're interacting with other people, just remember that, that everybody's going to be in their own time and will heal in different ways because it's a journey. So we all know that the past two years, we've been living with uncertainty, right? And yes, we're, we're moving towards uh, some normalcy. But again, we are still living in times of uncertainty. And there's a lot going on around us. And so how do we do that, right? How, how do we live in, in uncertainty for, for periods of time that we just don't know? And I have a word. It's called acceptance, okay? Stress and anxiety are normal parts of life. And it's important for us to accept that as a reality. Sometimes stress can be good for you as you, it might propel you forward, you know? And other times stress can be a hindrance and, and, and a challenge. And accepting those things will give you that path on how to, to manage it moving forward. Acceptance doesn't mean that you agree with everything that's happening. And this is a very key point. Acceptance is just recognizing what's not in your control, <coughs> excuse me, so that you can focus on really what is in your control, right? Really channeling and focusing that energy and saying, okay, I might not like it, but this is the way it's gonna be for a little bit. Now, what can I do? What can I focus on to make it better for myself and my loved ones? Okay, acceptance is critical. I personally love uh, quotes and I wanna read a, a, a quote, please. And it's from a Scott Baranado. When we name it and feel the feelings, it empowers us. When you name it, you feel it and it moves through you. Emotions need motion. It's important we acknowledge what we go through. <coughs> your work is to feel your sadness and fear and anger, whether or not someone else is feeling something. Fighting it doesn't help because your body is producing the feeling. If we allow the feelings to happen, they'll happen in an orderly way and it empowers us. Then we're not victims. And empowering ourselves is critical. Oops, sorry, technical challenges. Okay. So as you empower yourself, part of empowering is to take care of yourself. And it's critical to recognize what some of that stress looks like and take steps to build resilience, to cope with those feelings of stress and know where to go if you need help. Because 
it is okay. And there's lots of people around you that maybe you're not even thinking of, but you all have support systems and you've all been through hard things before and you'll know how to do it again. And so remember to recognize the symptoms of stress that you may be feeling. Maybe irritation, anger, denial, uncertainty, anxiety, being nervous, feeling helpless or powerless, lacking motivation, feeling tired, overwhelmed, or burnt out. I know a lot of people probably are feeling those emotions right now. So make sure that you try and check in with yourself every day because taking care of yourself is not a luxury. It's something that is critical for you to do and empower you to move forward. Whoop. And so we talked a little bit about stress, anxiety, and fear, depression, and what that all is. Let's talk a, a minute or two about stress in the body. Some of this may be uh, old information and maybe some of it is some new. So I'll go through it quickly. And if you have a question, please type it in the chat as Sharon and I will address all the questions uh, at the end. Stress isn't only something that's in a thought in your mind that just stays there. Stress, as we talked about, is energy, right? And it needs motion. And so it's going to affect maybe headaches, right? Your head, your mood, your skin, right? Maybe maybe you're breaking out or, or itching or hives. Your joints and your muscles, your heart, right? How, how many of you can relate to how your heart races a bit, your palms get sweaty, you maybe start to, to sweat uh, and, and feel uh, overcome by, by, by heat. That's all your, your heart and your mind and your body working together to tell you, hey, something's going on here. I'm feeling something. Maybe you get flutters in your stomach or feel a little, a little sick. Maybe you, you're not regular, right? Your, 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 your bowels are, are in, impacted. And we know that your immune system, stress impacts your immune system. So keeping all of your mind, body, emotions and behavior in connection is really important. And this slide shows just the, if you look at yourself and, and put stress in the middle, and you look at your mind, your body, emotions, and how those are, are coming out in behaviors. Our, our mind, bodies, and spirits are all connected. And as we take care of one, we take care of the others. Oh, wrong way, sorry. So being in a constant state of high alert is, is certainly not uh, a, a good thing and not what we as a species were, were, were built for, right? That fight or flight mode. And so I'm going backwards. And so let's talk a little bit about what we do, right? When we have all these feelings and emotions, how do we manage them? What do we do with them? Well, that's called resilience, right? And I love the term resilience. I know people say it a lot, but a lot of people don't really know exactly what that means because some people say, oh, I'm not resilient. Yes, you are. We've all lived through this so far. So every single one of you watching out there, you've built some resilience, whether you know it or not. Because what resilience is, is that we were built to bounce back. We were built to learn and grow from life's adversities. And we are all doing that every day as we move forward. And so, People who are resilient, right? There's a, there's a few books about resilient optimists and, and habits of resilient optimists. And so people who don't give up have a habit of interpreting setbacks as temporary, as local, and as changeable, right? This will change. It will go away. Every moment changes. It's just this one situation. It's specific to this. Take one step at a time and look at what you can accept and what you can focus on. Because changeable 
do things that I can do something about, right? And by looking at it in that way of resilience, we look at our whole being, right? And there's a model and it's called the PERMA model. And if you take all of these different components, positive emotion, right? That's part of our well-being. Happy people look back on the past and they look into the future with hope. And hope is a really big, powerful word as well. And th that positive emotion, you look forward with enjoyment and you're cherishing the present. What parts of it you can. Relationships. Everybody needs someone. And enhancing our well-being by sharing it with others and building strong emotions and relationships around us with friends, neighbors, family, coworkers are very important. Accomplishment. Everybody needs a win. We all do, right? And a win sometimes is small. It could really just be something that you have done that gives you a sense of accomplishment. Just being able to say, hey, I did that and I did it well. It's important. And engagement. Focusing on doing things that you enjoy. I know a lot of times the pandemic has, has caused some interruptions for a lot of people, right? Going to the gym or, or socializing or, or doing things that, that incorporated groups of people together. Now's your time. Try and focus on things that in the here and the present now, what gives you, what gives you joy and, and can you engage? And meaning, we are our best when we dedicate time to something greater than ourselves. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a, a civic group that you uh, spend some time with or, or a religious or a faith group or a school group or even a group that uh, is a, a professional group, right? So these areas all help us get our, our, our body and our mind and our spirit in synergy with each other and help us in overall well-being. So let's talk a little bit about resilience some more. And here's a couple of 10 tips for successful coping. And there's plenty more, but I figured let's keep it simple. Let's do 10 successful coping skills. Get the facts, okay? A lot of us, in fact, most of us, are inundated with news constantly. Right? And for a long time, we wanted that. And at some point, many of you might have felt it's too much. It's too much to be constantly bombarded. So maybe finding that, that source of information that you trust and taking some social media breaks and, and really kind of shutting it off sometimes and only looking for it when you need the facts, right? Shutting it down every once in a while is, is very helpful. It gives you sense of peace and, and a minute to, to really process what you're hearing and seeing and what's going on. So remember to trust and rely on your trusted resources. Take control of what you can, right? We talked about that. And you can not control what other people are going to do. And and in the, in the pandemic, a lot of people, oh, this one doesn't wear a mask, or this one does, or this one doesn't, doesn't do this or that. It's really focusing in on what you can do and how do you take control of what is in, in your realm of possibility. And again, how you experience stress. We've talked a lot about this. Take, a, take stock in yourself every day. And Sharon might add some things at the end where she might have some tips for us to do that as well. Look at your behavior. Look at your physical being. Scan your body. Are you struggling with something? What could it be? Your emotions and how are you thinking? Are you erasing thoughts? Are you thinking clearly? Are you feeling pretty good about, about where you're at? So really taking time, it's that self-care component again and knowing and scanning yourself for some stress and anxiety and emotion and feelings. 
breathing. It sounds so simple, but yet it's so complicated sometimes. Practicing breathing, right? We're going to practice in a moment a technique called stop. Stop. Take a breath. Observe your surroundings or your body. What's your body feeling? And then proceed with thoughtful awareness for what's happening. Developing a meditation practice. Uh, one I, I, I mention here is box breathing, right? It, there are so many different variations on YouTube or, or on, the, on the websites. that uh, There's a lot of different apps and websites that you can, can find something that works for you. It's very, very important. And it's something private that you can do anywhere to ground yourself, really. It can be done in the car, in a meeting. Nobody really has to know what you're doing. So it's something that you can always take with you and keep with you. <coughs> Excuse me, staying healthy, right? Hydrating, drinking plenty of water, exercising, eating healthy foods. Um, coffee, I know coffee uh, gets me going in the morning, but maybe not you know, excessive amounts of caffeine throughout your day. Alcohol, you know, I know that uh, the data from the pandemic shows that there's been an uptick in uh, alcohol consumption and, and uh, that's something that you might want to look at and might want to uh, scale back if, if it's becoming more than usual. And getting plenty of sleep and rest. And again, consulting your physicians if you're feeling like something is, is, is bothering you or, or not right. You know, taking care of our health during the pandemic uh, sometimes was difficult. So make sure that you're getting those screenings that you maybe put off or really getting to that doctor's appointment. So staying healthy can mean so many different things. So make sure that that's part of your resiliency plan. Exercising is something I need to do more of. You know, find something that works for you. Get your body outside. Take a walk. If it's a gym or in your house, you know, something simple. Some, some simple exercise that you can go ahead and practice. Number seven, keeping things in perspective. This is critical. And I know that Sharon's going to walk us through a little bit about this as well as we can practice some of these skills. Using your spiritual beliefs and practices to keep you grounded. We can all get caught up in things so easily. So consider uh, maybe volunteering or offering some support to other people who who may, may need it, that may help ground you. You know, really setting intentions for yourself and, and being thankful and for what you have or what you've been accomplished, been afforded uh, the ability to accomplish and make thankfulness a habit. And really optimism, you know, it doesn't come easy to everybody every day. So it's something you can practice, practice that optimism and looking forward. And let's practice something. I know I can't see all of you, but you can see me. So maybe take one moment. Stop what you're doing. Take a breath. What's going on around you? What are you feeling? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you smelling? another deep breath. And proceed on. We'll continue to move forward. Just a real quick, quick tip. Again, nobody needs to know that you're doing it, but it's a way to just stop, think, and get yourself centered again. Connecting, right? We all had to find new ways to connect to people for the past two years. Connection really was, to many people, hugs and handshakes and, and, and physically in rooms and sharing laughter and meals and, and joy together, signs of, of, of well wishes. And we've had to really figure out how to stay connected without some of those things. And so... While some of those, those new FaceTime or, 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 
or um, Skyping or phone, uh, maybe those are things that are going to stay for you because you found that they've really served a great purpose and filled a gap maybe that was there. And then maybe you're going to go and, and share some, some in-person uh, uh, gatherings with, with those around you. And by doing that, when you connect, you can share your fears and your worries with those that you trust the most. And not only sharing, but listening to others, listening to what they're going through and, and how they're feeling and ways that they're, that they're managing their, their emotions and building their resiliency. So connecting is very important. And connect away. Connect in any way that, that, that feels comfortable and that you can. And this is something I have to do. Simplify. Take the opportunities to simplify and find joy in your home, in your, in your, in your workspace, wherever you are. Listening to music, reading, sharing a, a movie, whether in person or online now. Um, using the time to declutter, whether it's physical declutter and organizing or maybe emotional clutter. What have you been holding on to that you can let go? So simplifying means a lot of things and has some great powers. And again, asking for help. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are, are going through the same thing. If there's a silver lining to any of the struggles and the tasks that we've had to go through over these few years, it's that I think that everybody can relate to a feeling of either fear or sadness or, or, or frustration. People are really understanding that emotions are normal and not everybody manages them the same. And so connecting to, to people and asking for help hopefully is, is, is a, a more uh, comfortable task for us to do and for us to be well received in doing. And so just a, a, a few tips on knowing where to go to get help. There's a ton of resources uh, on online and in your communities. If you are in immediate jeopardy or danger or somebody is, 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 is in immediate crisis, there's the National Suicide Prevention Hotlines. There are National Domestic Violence Hotlines, Disaster Distress Hotlines. If you want to help, if you want help finding treatment, you can go to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration and see what providers are in your area. You can call your insurance companies if you have insurance. And some trusted sources to get information about mental health and COVID are the CDC, the American Psychological Association, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NIOSH for workplace safety, and again, the CDC has a ton of facts on COVID-19. So there is help out there. No matter where you sit, no matter where you are, there is somebody always there to listen. And for Atlantic Health, we have five campuses. And at each of those five campuses, we have a 24-hour hotline. Should you find yourself in that, that emergency where you are in need of somebody to talk to right then and there, because you're af afraid of, of harming yourself or others. And there's always a crisis. There's always somebody behind those doors of the emergency department at the hospital. And for those of, of you out there who may be like me or may newly be recovering from COVID, we run a peer support group every Wednesday. And it's a bunch of people just like I, I am in the group and, and I, I, I do run the group, uh, a bunch of people who have, who have been there, who have had COVID, who may still be experiencing uh, long COVID and, uh, and, and, and how we got through it and how we are continuing to get through it. So please know that there's a lot of support out there. And with that, I'm going to open it up for, whoops, <laughs> I'm going to open it up uh, for questions and answers. And I'm also going to ask um, uh, Sharon Kelly 
to uh, jump on and help us with uh, with that process. Terrific. Jennifer and Sharon, uh, we do have several questions from our guests, so I'll, I'll start to read them off uh, for your response. Number one, with mask mandates changing, how could we spread understanding and acceptance if someone wants to continue wearing a mask in a public situation? Sure. So, Sharon, are you on the line? Is she Yep. Yes, we can hear you. So I can I can take that quickly. I think I think it it goes back to um, what we talked about early on is um, accepting right and spreading that acceptance and spreading that education. You can only control what you are comfortable doing and what is in your control, and so by focusing in on what you can do. Um, is and if you're if you're uh, making that choice to wear a mask, you really can't tell somebody to to wear it or not. Um, but you can uh, limit your uh, limit your exposure if 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 need be, or or change um, or, or or offer um, information. But as far as that, it's really spreading that kindness and awareness. Next question is. Uh, with regard to the different stages of healing, how can we adequately express to others where we are in those stages during the pandemic? That's a question I would love for our clinical, uh, our, our clinical uh, social, uh, 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 provider. Sharon, do you want to take that one? Sure. Are, now, if you can hear me, right, Jen? Everybody can hear me, I guess? Yes. They can hear us? Okay. Terrific. Great. Well, so thanks so much. Um, so that really does speak to the, the stages of, of grief, right? And I think so much, uh, Jen, of, and I wanna say thank you so much for all this wealth of information, just uh, a lot, but I think that we start with understanding ourselves, right? That self-awareness is the first, uh, is really a lot about what you've been talking about. And um, we have to kind of know where we are before we can let other people know where we are, right? So part of it is just knowing for oneself that, um, you know, I'm still grieving or I'm kind of irritable and in, in that stage of anger. Um, there's a lot of research about the stages of grief, but basically we kind of know that there's a little bit of time when we're grieving where we're in denial. We don't believe it, it's not happening. And then we can kind of bargain. Well, if only I hadn't gone to that party. Well, if only this had happened, um, then we can get angry, right? And then maybe we're really sad. And then eventually, as Jen said, we want to get to that place of acceptance, right? So if we're trying to explain this to someone else, um, we have to know where we are ourselves. And that takes some time. And I think kind of wrapping the whole thing up is being really patient with ourselves and uh, generous and kind to ourselves. And also maybe that we don't really owe everybody an explanation for where we are. You don't have to tell everybody, but you might wanna be able to know who are the really important people, my loved ones, my close friends, maybe a chosen colleagues that, you know, I'm still grieving about this or I'm, you know, still maybe a little raw or irritable. And that gives that circle of close people, um, a heads up on where you are. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I'm thinking. Terrific. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, we have a next question here. How do we communicate to our colleagues, our work colleagues and our employers, how we're still feeling the stressors during the pandemic? And this is a perfect one for Sharon, who is also part of our a concern program, which is our employee assistance program. So we have her on here and she can guide us through that question. Yeah, I mean, we do, that is our mission really is to work with employees um, of a, not just Atlantic Health, but also many different companies throughout New Jersey. And um, I think there's a couple layers to that, right? Again, I think it's the same answer. We have to know where we are, what we need and be good at sort of that self-advocacy, 
one of the programs that we teach is uh, professional self-care and knowing how to advocate for yourself professionally in your work environment is um, a developmental career skill. And part of it may be knowing what the policies and procedures are within your organization, right? So getting really good about that, you may need to consult with your human resource or you know team, um, whatever department that is that handles the employee um, policies and have a conversation with your manager, your direct report to explain where you are in the process and what you think you might need in order to function well in your job, do your job well, and um, you know continue to contribute. I think it's a lot, number one, that self-awareness is key. Number two, know your organization's policies and procedures and be able to communicate directly with your, uh, your manager. And then they can help you maybe come up with a plan for how to um, navigate the, the rest of the team. Terrific. Thank you once again, Sharon. Uh, we have another question here. How can we as individuals be more empathetic and understanding if we see that somebody is having trouble managing their emotions during this time? So we're not saying if, if you're having the issue, but if, if we see someone else, how could we be more empathetic and understanding? So I'll, I'll just say, and then I, again, um, the brilliant Sharon, um, but I'll just say, first of all, I think that one of the things we touched upon in the, um, in, in, in the presentation is, um, is um, the, the, the silver lining in a sense of having, having the ability to have these meaningful conversations about mental health. And um, really kind of getting comfortable with language and, and, uh, and, and maybe the, practicing words that, that you haven't really used before. Um, and, and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new time in our, in our world of communication. And Sharon, do you want to, um, yeah, I think it's, a, on that? I, it's such a great question and it, you know, again, multi-layered, right? If somebody is having a really hard time with dealing with this and they are not um, managing their own emotional states very well, they're not um, regulating very well, that can come across as either a lot of different things, but um, if it's in any relationship, if, I'm thinking in terms of at work, um, you know, if it's anger, um, I think people have to be held responsible no matter what they're going through, right? It's not okay to express anger in a way that threatens other people or makes other people feel um, you know, at risk. So you know, we have to be able to say, you know, you're going through a really rough time right now and it's also not okay that you're shouting or you know, banging on things. We have to help you figure out how to um, you know, be okay. If they're um, overwhelmed emotionally and un tearful, unable to sort of manage their, um, their sad emotions, we might need to ask them, do you need a little bit of space? Do you need some privacy? Um, how can I help? What will be helpful to you right now? While respecting yourself, right? Because you have to stay safe yourself, even if someone's going through a hard time, it's not one or the other. I don't know if that's helpful. Very much so. Thank you so much, Sharon. We we just had one last question. Uh, long hauler is a, is a term that many of us have not yet heard before. We've heard of people who <coughs> had COVID and then recovered or unfortunately did not recover. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience as a long hauler? Sure. Um, long hauler is actually um, a term that it's a grassroots term, to be honest. And it it was um, it was really the the perseverance and and really social media who who deemed it that um, there was a lot of people who um, were not getting better after those two weeks. That um, you know everybody said, oh well, in two weeks you should be fine. On well, two weeks, a lot of people weren't fine. Um, and I can only speak for myself, of course. Um, this month marks two years 
for me. Um, I was hospitalized and, um, and I still have uh, lingering uh, symptoms. I do have um, some damage that, um, you know, to, to my body, um, my lungs and, and, and whatnot, um, that I will be managing for, you know, some time ahead. And there are symptoms such as brain fog. You might have seen me stumble on a word or two uh, and, and forget where, where I was for a moment every, every now and again. Um, but the, the, the term long hauler really is about uh, some of us who continue to manage symptoms, continue to manage not just physical symptoms, but also the emotional and the mental uh, health symptoms that um, having the, the uh, COVID virus has, um, has left us with. So um, while, while the term is, you know, it's not a, a clinical term per se, um, there, there are a lot of people who um, are, still ha are, are still in need. And so for myself, I find that the support group, um, talking to others who are like me or, uh, or not like me and have different symptoms or um, are still navigating uh, the healthcare. You know, sometimes we do have uh, COVID recovery centers. I know Atlantic Health has, has a great one. Um, and there are others in, in the region and, are, and across, across the world, globe right now. And so people are still learning. Uh, our, our doctors and scientists are still learning. And, uh, and, and, and we as the, the first, if you will, uh, the first wave, I could call myself, um, we're, we're helping uh, hopefully uh, chart new territory for treatments and whatnot. So um, I hope that answers the question. Very much so. So with that, uh, we'll move on to closing remarks. Uh, Jennifer, on... I think we have one more question. Oh, do we have one more question? Fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. One more question. How could someone con uh, connect with Atlantic Health for some counseling or sure. groups with coping? Sure. So we have an access department um, and... and um, calling the access center, there's lovely people that answer the phone who will walk you through, listen to what your needs are and connect you to the right services. And that phone number is 888-247-1400. Or you can go to atlantichealth.org and follow the links to behavioral health. Can I ask a question? I um I put it in the chat, but I don't know if uh, you know that's that's as uh, easily seen. But can you talk a little bit about um, that this sort of growing phenomenon of a lot of people who have uh, post COVID and not immediately post COVID, but like three, four, five months post COVID, develop um, either continue on with the loss of smell or get these distorted taste and smell, or I've often heard phantom smells like they smell smoke but nobody around them is smoking so so you broke up a bit but i but i but i believe you're you're asking about some of the lingering uh, or some of the symptoms that maybe don't don't uh, aren't there right away but then um pop up about you know a couple months after is that what i'm hearing yes it's and i also put it in the chat if that's easier um, but it is this, sure. you know, I, I, you hear a lot about sort of three variations of it, either they never regained taste or smell, or they get these phantom dis, um, smells, uh, smells that aren't there, you know, like a smoke smell, but nobody's smoking, um, or distorted uh, smell and taste. And it affects um, the odors of things, but it also affects the taste of food. Um, is that something that you've, as a group, have sort of encountered? With folks, or sure. So, so what I'll I'll caveat to say I'm not a doctor, um, and that uh, I would encourage you if you are experiencing those symptoms to reach out. Um, if those are if the if if what you're talking about is is the smells and the phantom smells, um, probably to neurology. Um, but I will I I can share you know through the peer uh, support group. Uh, that is something that we uh, we have had uh, some of our members report, and um, it is something that uh, people are going through. So um, 
I can I can assure you that that if somebody is um, having that, they're not alone, um, but that they should definitely seek uh, medical attention. Fantastic. Jennifer, thanks so much on behalf of the foundation, and we, we, we thank you for joining us. And thank you. we extend an open invitation for you to return anytime to campus. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak about this. This lecture is being filmed today and will be a valuable resource uh, for our campus community and for the Sussex County uh, community. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank the 100 Women Project Steering Committee. That includes Judge Lorraine Parker, the 100 Women Project founder, and the Sussex County Community College Foundation Board of Directors. I'd like to thank Lee Ellison of Karen Ann Quinlis Hospice, Mary Ann Fox, Sussex County Community College trustee and Foundation Board of Directors, Jamie Lockatour of Thor Labs, Robin Tomlinson, Provident Bank, and the Foundation Board of Directors, as well as Dr. Heidi Weber, SUNY Orange, Orange County Community College, and the Sussex County Community College Foundation Board of Directors. I'd like to give a special thanks to Christina Quinones, the Foundation's Assistant, and our media services assistant, Tim O'Connor, for making this virtual event a reality. So far this year, we've raised $3,500 from about 30 supporters for the 100 Women Projects Endowed Scholarship. Once again, if you would like to support the scholarship, do so now. Please go to sussex.edu slash 100 Women Project to make your donation today, if you haven't done so already. And with that, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your support of the 100 Women Project. Have a good day.